So let me first thank the Bank of Japan for this uh, very nice invitation. I'm, I'm honored and happy to do it. It is an issue uh, that I've thought about for many years and uh, I'm going to do my best in giving you my current thoughts on the issue. So the starting point is that now for, for a few decades, uh, a bit longer in Japan, and then the same happened in the US and in most European countries, advanced economies have faced a very low nominal and real interest rates. And that's really the starting point of, of this talk. I think it's important to distinguish uh, two different dimensions. The first one is known as secular stagnation. I'm not sure that's a great word for it, but that's it has become the standard word. And I would define it as if I define the, the safe neutral rate, which is going to be uh, our star in my in my notations, as the interest rate, which is consistent with output at potential. Uh, then what has happened is when there is secular stagnation is that this neutral rate is less, is very low and is less than the growth rate. And that has a number of implications. There's a separate issue, which is related but independent, which is the so-called zero lower bound or effective lower bound, which, which comes from the fact that nominal interest rates, defined here as I rather than R, uh, cannot be very negative. We thought it was zero, so we've learned that we can go a bit below, but uh, are constrained. And that in turn puts a lower bound on how low the real interest rate can go, which is equal to minus the inflation rate. We may well have the first without the second. The second depends very much on the average level of inflation, but both may be at play and indeed have been at play uh, in, in, in many countries in the last 10, 20 years. As Governor Kuroda said, I mean, these have dramatic implications, I think, for the way we think about fiscal and monetary policy. And given that now it has been decades, it's, it's a good time to take stock. Uh, and I thought I would focus on, on three issues. Um, you know, all of them have been discussed at length in Japan, but are still very relevant. The, the first one is what will happen to interest rates in the future? Uh, are we likely to face both dimensions, secular stagnation and the zero lower bound in the future? That's an essential question. If the answer was that they are going to go back to much higher levels, then we could go back to the old way of doing business. The second is assuming that this is going to be the environment that we are in, uh, how do we assess debt sustainability in the current environment? It's very clear that the old rules which was some level of debt or debt to GDP, uh, just are not the right ones. And then the really hard question, which is how should we conduct fiscal policy in that environment? You know, in what ways do we change the way we thought about it uh, right, uh, before? And what I'm going to try to do is review both the theory, not in detail, but I, the, the, I think the way we have thought about it in academia, and the mapping to practical implications to what policymakers should do. And here, I should say that I feel a bit guilty given this lecture uh, in, in Japan, because policymakers have been ahead of the game. They have had to take decisions. In general, they have taken the right decisions. And I come now, uh, but really they, they, uh, they played a major role in, in what has happened and how we think about these things. So let me start with the first question, which is interest rates now and in the future. There has been an enormous amount of empirical work on the issue. I think the way to think about it is to think in terms of three different graphs, and that's what I'm going to do. So the first one is the one that you all have seen and is usually presented by people who want to insist on the fact that nominal rates are coming down and real rates are coming down, and that's the evolution of uh, real, namely adjusted for inflation ex ante, tenure rates in the US, in the Eurozone, and in Japan. And it's an absolutely striking uh, graph in the sense that they go down. It's clear that it's just not due just to the financial crisis or to COVID. They made a small difference, but it's really a trend. 
The problem with this is that it is actually, I think, misleading. And the next graph, which is the same for the US, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite do it for Japan, but it would be rather similar, starts not in 1985, which is what the previous graph did, but goes back to 1950. And then you see what happens when you start in 1985. You start from a really unusual peak, and therefore the decline is absolutely striking. But if you take the longer view, it is not as obvious that there has been a major decline. What, what has happened, I think it's important to take it into account, is that what is exceptional in a way is the 70s and the 80s. In the 70s, uh, we had the oil shocks, we had a lot of inflation, the nominal rates didn't follow, didn't increase one for one, therefore the real rates became very negative. And in the 80s, there was consolidation, there was the Volcker the uh, de disinflation, the Thatcher disinflation, so rates went up a lot. So I think these two decades are really the exceptions. So I think what you have to do is take out the 1970 to 1990 part, kind of wipe it out, then you see that there has been still a decline in the average safe rate from comparing the 50s to the 70s and then the 90s to the 2020s. There has been a decline, but it's much less dramatic than the decline on, on the first slide. It is still very relevant. Now, what do we make of the decline? And so I'm going to show you the, the third graph, which is due to somebody called Paul Schmesling at, at Harvard. And he has done an amazing uh, job as a historian. He basically has found proxies for the safe rate starting in the 1300s. So what you see here is various safe rates in various places. At the beginning, it's basically the Venice borrowing from the rest of the world. And at the end, it's mostly the US Treasury. Uh, but what is absolutely striking there is the decline. Basically, if you look, it's what on average about two to three basis points a year for uh, more than uh, 700 years. And I think this says there's something very deep in the decline in interest rates. And once I think once you've seen this picture, you say, OK, there are all kinds of things affecting interest rates, but this is really the underlying uh, trend and uh, it's likely to continue. So I'm going to give you my own assessment of, of what's going to happen. I, so this is my interpretation in this slide. I think that looking just as post-1985 is misleading. Uh, you will really have to take out the 70s and the 80s. And I think the downtrend is, is very striking, very powerful. And this suggests that there are fundamental factors at work. Many of the studies of the decline interest rates have 16 different factors at work. That may well be, but I think some of them clearly play a major role. And I would say the two which play a major role is that as income has increased, saving has increased. When people are poor, they don't save. And so saving has increased, this tends to decrease the, the rate. As life expectancy has increased, people have started saving for retirement. That also has increased saving. These are very deep trends uh, under, uh, underlying the evolution of saving. Uh, and interest rates. And then I think what has happened also is liquidity for these safe assets has steadily increased. If you had a claim on Venice in the 1300s, it may have been safe, but it was not very easy to exchange for another one or to get cash for it. Where now, if you have treasury bills, you go there, you sell it, and there is no issue. And I think these two factors are really the main two factors at work. And the implication, I think, is that these low rates are here in expected value to stay. I feel fairly strongly that the stories which tell us that it's going to reverse and we're going to have high safe rates are probably not the right ones. So what I conclude here, my bottom line on this, and this determines the rest of the presentation, the rest of how we think about fiscal, is that there might be bumps. I wouldn't be surprised if R exceeded G once in a while. For example, I think the Biden stimulus program, as I've argued, is too strong and may force the Fed to increase R more than G. So we may have a few years of R greater than G. But this is not what matters. What matters is, you know, the, the, the steady state. And I think we have to assume 
that with high probability, but not full probability, not one probability, uh, we're going to be in a regime of uh, circular stagnation for some time. Uh, the reason I hedge a bit is that I wish we had really convincing explanations, quantitative explanations of these declines. And having looked at the literature, I'm not absolutely sure. We have many factors, but we don't know exactly how powerful a role they play. So I would plan on the assumption that R star is going to be less than G, very likely, but not with probability one. And that has implications for fiscal policy. What about the, the ZLB, the zero lower bound? I also think here that we're going to be in a regime in which the zero lower bound either binds strictly, in which case we see zero nominal rates, or the nominal rates are a bit higher, maybe two or three percent, but that still reduces very much the room that the monetary authority has uh, to use monetary policy. I'm not going to go into the other instruments that the central bank can use. I think we can all agree that that restricts the room that monetary policy has uh, to maintain uh, demand and maintain output. So this is my conclusion. This is the world that we should be expecting in the future and how we should think about policy. I'll give you one more piece of information, which is this. So the uh, sovereign bonds uh, are, uh, are also, uh, there are also options uh, traded on sovereign bonds. So you can compute the implied probabilities that the investors put on various outcomes. So for example, if you take this, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it for Japan. I couldn't find the data. Maybe it exists or maybe the option market is, is, is not deep enough. I do not know. But if you look, for example, at the first line, what you see is that investors put implicitly, and they put their money there, a probability of 90% that in five years, the short rate will be less than 4%. 4% is an interesting number because it is roughly what we expect nominal growth to be, more or less 2%, real and 2% inflation. So basically they give a very high probability for uh, R less than G five years out. It goes to 98% for Europe, and it goes to very high numbers uh, when you look at 10 years out. So it seems to me that here, I tend to agree with investors. We basically are going to be in this environment uh, for some time. So let me now move to the two issues uh, about fiscal policy that I want to deal with. The first one is debt sustainability. Uh, the first line is, is, you know, is a no-brainer. I think everybody now understands that there is no magic debt number, whether it's 60% or 90%. And if anything, Japan has convinced the world that you can go to 150% or even more if you look at gross debt. So it's clear that there's just no magic number there. And the reason is, is an absolutely obvious one, which is that the sustainable debt ratio is completely different if a safe rate is 10% or 1%. What matters to a first approximation is the product of debt and the interest rate. And that clearly implies that there is no magic level of, of debt. Now, how do we make progress? Well, this is all the algebra you're going to get from my presentation. I think you start from the basic dynamics of, of the debt to GDP ratio. So D here is the debt to GDP ratio. R is the real interest rate, G is the growth rate, and S is the primary balance. So it's positive if there's a surplus and it's negative if there's a deficit. Now, we can compute the primary balance, which is such that we stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. So we do D is equal to D minus one. That this year, that ratio this year is equal to that uh, ratio last year. And that gives you this expression that the primary balance S is equal to R minus G divided by one plus G, this doesn't much matter, times that. And the uh, implication of this is that if R minus G is negative, then the right hand side is negative, and therefore you can stabilize that with a negative primary balance, namely a primary deficit, and keep that constant. So there are three ways of stating the implications of R less than G. Uh, the first one is the one I just gave, perfectly reasonable. Can run, we can run a primary deficit, not necessarily 
not necessarily very large, depends on the equation, uh, and keep the debt ratio constant. But you can make it, you can actually say, look at the e equation and, and state it in stronger terms, which is you can run any primary deficit, even much larger than that, and that will increase, but it will not explode. The world in which R minus G is negative is a world in which debt can increase to a high levels, but it doesn't explode in the same way as it would if R minus G was positive. And then even maybe more strikingly, and I've found that people are surprised by this way of saying it, you can issue additional debt once, so you can have a deficit if you need in one year, and you never have to raise taxes to pay for it. And the reason is that once you've done this, then debt will obviously be higher, but it will decrease slowly over time. Uh, because R minus G is, uh, is, is negative. So this is the most striking way of, of stating it, which is you can issue additional debt and you don't have to raise taxes. Implicitly what's happening is that the investors are accepting such a low rate that they are ones paying for it. But in terms of raising taxes, you don't need to do it. So if we were in a world in which R minus G was going to be negative forever with probability one, well, these conclusions would be the right one now. And there would be no issue of sustainability that cannot explode in that world. Now, why is it that this is much too strong a statement and we have to be much more careful? It's for two reasons. The first one is uncertainty. Uh, and as I said, I think the probability that R greater than G, so that the inequality reverses, uh, is small, but it is positive and, and, and you have to be careful about it. So you have to take this into account and it says if you have very high debt, that might well be an issue if there was a change in the sign. Probability is small, but if it happens, you have to be ready for it. So just a warning here, there has been a shift in people focusing on debt uh, from debt, 60%, for example, in the Maastricht Treaty, to debt service. I think that's misleading. Uh, that service is better than that, but it's a dangerous variable to focus on too much because it can change very much. If D is very large, such as in Japan, then a change in R minus G, the uncertainty about R minus G gets magnified. So for a given variation of R minus G, if D is large, you may find yourself having to generate a very large primary surplus if circumstances uh, go against you. So that's the first reason. And this says you really have to think about more than just that service. And I come to it in the next slide. The other, the other reason is that that, you know, I've talked about R star or R when the two are the same as just given. But think of a closed economy. When you increase that, you're going to crowd out capital and you're going to increase all rates. You're going to increase the marginal product. You're going to increase rates. And therefore, with a sufficiently high level of debt, you're going to actually increase R above G. And that's a limit that you have. Now, this is for a closed economy. In an open economy, you know, it's really global debt which is going to matter. So you have more room as an individual country, but eventually there's a limit as well. So this is where I try to go from general considerations to, okay, so you are the fiscal council in Japan or in Brussels or in Paris. You know, how do you assess that sustainability? And so first you need some definition. And so the way I think that sustainability can be uh, defined, it's a probabilistic, probabilistic, probabilistic statement. Uh, it can be that the probability that's sustainable is, is one, but that rarely happens. It's likely to be 0.99 or something like this. So it's a probabilistic, probabilistic statement. And I would express it as, as written here in blue, which is what is the probability that over the next five, 10 years, I think looking beyond this, you really don't know what will happen. The country cannot generate the primary surplus sufficient to cover interest payments. If this probability is small, namely it's very likely that the country can generate a primary surplus, then that is sustainable. That seems to me a, an operational definition, which is implementable and clear. So when you think about the answer to this, you realize that it depends on just not the level of debt, but a very long list of things which all matter. 
So the first one is the distribution of R minus G, obviously, which I've talked about already, both the first moment, the expected path of R minus G, but also the second moment, which is how much can R minus G move? What's the probability that R minus G changes sign, for example? When you think about it, you think also that something which is very important to take into account is implicit liabilities. If you have a retirement system or you have social insurance, it may well be that in the end, something will have to be financed from the budget and that you have to take this into account. You have to think about the path of the primary deficit. And again, you have to think about the first moment, which is what you expect to happen. And the second moment, which is how could it go wrong? You have to think about the initial tax rate because the higher the initial tax rate, the less room there is to generate a primary surplus through increase in taxes. And uh, for example, for my country, France, I think we're very much at the limit of what we can do. Now, even if you have room, you have to think about the politics of it, which is the nature of a government. Uh, if a large adjustment is needed, you're going to need to go from a primary deficit to primary surplus. It's going to be unpleasant. And therefore, whether it's a coalition government or a single party government uh, is going to make a difference. The ability to do something big will depend on, on the politics. And then the last one in that list, I mean, I can think of other factors, is the maturity of the debt. And that's central because if R minus D changes, what's going to change is the short rate. And the long rate, which you basically committed to earlier in time, is going to adjust slowly as you roll over the debt. So if the maturity of the debt is long, uh, then you get much more time to adjust. If you have, if you need to go from a primary deficit to a primary surplus, say from minus two to plus two percent, if the maturity of the debt is 10 years, you have roughly 10 years to do it. If the maturity of the debt is one year, you're in serious trouble. So when all this is said, I think that the notion that you can write a rule uh, as the EU has tried, which was going to capture all these elements and give you a yes or no answer, is unrealistic. That's an exercise which can only be done, I think, at one time, in one place, every year, every country. And so what I've argued, and I do not know whether this is done in Japan in the way that I would like it to see, uh, is that you need the right analytical tool and this tool is what we call Stochastic Debt Sustainability Analysis, SDSA. You do it under existing policies, existing and committed policies. And then you see the distribution of outcomes five or 10 years out, if you do this exercise, and you look at the probability that you have a primary balance, which is not enough to offset or to cover the interest on the debt. And that is an exercise which I've done at the IMF a few times when I was there. It doesn't give completely satisfying answers. You can disagree about the standard deviation of R and things like this, but it allows a very useful discussion. And I found it to be a very useful tool. What you do with it after this, how much power you give to whoever uh, has done the analysis, presumably some independent expert, is to be worked out, and that's a big issue. But I think that's what needs to be done. In the case in which the conclusion of an expert authority, so say a fiscal council, uh, says, well, there is an issue, then the government has to come back and say, okay, we're going to modify policies in this way, and this will take care of the issue. And then there is monitoring over time. I think that's what should be done. It's very concrete, and I think it is surely useful whether it's enough uh, i think it has to be seen and it has to be tried let me go briefly through this slide given the, the time constraint which is one of the reasons why r may move a lot and that's especially true of emerging markets but it could be true of advanced economies is that there are multiple equilibria that's you know we call them sudden stops uh, we give them various names, but we know that in this market, if investors start being scared, for no reason maybe, but they start being scared and they anticipate some probability of default, it's going to show up as a higher spread and therefore a higher rate. And unfortunately, this higher rate may well make their worries self-fulfilling. And we have plenty of models in which this happens, and there's plenty of cases in the world where this has happened. 
And so the question in this case is, what do you do? So one, res one response is, well, let's have a level of debt which is so low that these worries cannot be self-fulfilling, because if that is small, then even a larger spread will not imply a you know, much larger interest rate, um, interest payment. And I think that's misguided, and I'm doing current research on this, uh, which is that the range of equilibria, where you can have a normal equilibrium and a really bad one, is very large. So they're going from, say, doing fiscal austerity and getting your debt from 100% to 90% doesn't get you out of the multiple equilibria range. And so this is, I think, not a good argument for trying to reduce that because you'd have to reduce that to 40% or 50%. And that's totally impossible to do uh, over you know, a decade or so. So what do we do in this case? And that's very relevant. Uh, can, you can you eliminate the multiple equilibria? And here I want to issue a warning and in a way a puzzle, which is if it's a purely self-fulfilling one, so there's absolutely no meat to the rumors, uh, investors just get scared, then the central bank can, with deep pockets, uh, play the role of a large stable investor. And that's what the BOJ is doing in effect. It can say, look, we're going to basically commit to a rate and will intervene as much as needed. In this case, the other investors have no reason to go away. It works. And so far it has worked. What worries me is what happens when these rumors have some credence, there's some sense in which maybe the default risk has become positive. And in this case, it's not clear that the central bank can actually do the same as it was doing before in the previous paragraph. The reason is that when the central bank intervenes, basically it swaps two assets. It buys government bonds and it issues bank reserves, central bank reserves. Now, this is just a change in the liabilities. So that the liabilities of the consolidating government, which is the central bank and the government, has not changed. And indeed, if people think that the bank reserves are safe, then the risk premium associated with the bonds which remain on the market is now higher because some of the liabilities are now safe, the bank reserves, that means that the rest of it is less safe. So if I were to write down more, I would get the result that such intervention actually increases the spread on the bonds that remain in the market. Now, that's not what we see. What we see is that the BOJ is able to do exactly what it wants. Maybe it's because, you know, there's no truth to the rumors and it's fine, but if there were, to be, then I worry that uh, it could maybe do and not work. And I think that's an issue we have to think about. Let me now move to the last two slides, which is optimal fiscal uh, debt policy, which is different from that sustainability, right? I mean, you may be able to sustain 150% of GDP. That doesn't mean that you should have 150% of GDP. And so here the big question is, when you think about for optimal fiscal policy, you're thinking of welfare. And so the question is, are these low rates, or less than G, a sign of dynamic inefficiency? Uh, dynamic inefficiency means that there's just too much capital and the marginal product of capital is very low and that is reflected in safe rates as well as other rates. And as you know, for those of you who have gone through these models, this is the model that Peter Diamond many, many years ago, 50 years ago or more, uh, or down, instead of overlapping generation more. And he showed that when R was less than G, then actually there was too much capital. And then that would be good. That would absolutely, absolutely be good. Uh, all generations would benefit from issuing debt until the crowding out of capital was such that the interest rate was equal to G. By issuing debt and using it to, for example, give goods to people currently alive, they would be better off. And then future generations would have less capital because it would have been partly displaced by debt, but it would be good because capital was just not productive. When we taught this, and you know, I taught this when I was still teaching at MIT, I would say that can happen, but it never happens. And I think what we've started thinking about is, well, could we be there? And so the next step has been, and that's what I worked on uh, two years ago, is what, are, what is the rate in this type of law, in the diamond law, what rate should we be looking at? Should we be looking at the safe rate, 
R, which is less than G, or should we be looking at the average marginal product of capital, which is substantially higher and is greater than G, which is the good rate? And what I found and what I showed in my presidential address was that it was closer to being the safe rate, but it was not quite. That basically it was a mix, it was a weighted average of the safe rate and the average marginal product of capital. So that we were probably not in the dynamic inefficiency region, there was not too much capital, but that was not very costly. Capital was just not very productive. So this is, I think, the way to think about it. There are other reasons to be skeptical that we have too much capital. So, and that the safe rate is not the right rate to look at. The first one is the equity premium puzzle, which is one of the major puzzles in agroeconomics. People ask for much too large a premium on the holding risky stuff. An uh, implication of this is that given the marginal product, they accept much too low real safe rate. And so as long as we don't quite know why the equity premium puzzle is there, it may well be that the safe rate is not a good signal of, 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 of uh, what's happening uh, in, uh, in with the marginal product of capital. The other which uh, we know is financial repression. And at many times in history, what has happened is that the Treasury told the central bank or told the banks, sorry, told the banks to hold sovereign bonds at very low rates. And that doesn't exist anymore, at least in that form, but there's something which resembles it a bit, which is liquidity requirements. Liquidity requirements are, it says retirements, they should be requirements. Uh, liquidity requirements are perfectly justified in terms of financial stability but they have the effect of forcing banks to hold more of safe assets and therefore they depress the safe rate. And that's also a consideration which has to be taken into account. So the conclusion of this is, you know, the question was, is that good? Which was the, the upper part of the, of, the, of the slide or is that bad? And I think the answer is that that crowds capital. I think that remains true, uh, but the cost in terms of welfare may not be very large. So the cost of using that is relatively low. So if you have good uses for it, you can use it. Basically, your cost benefit analysis tells you, yes, you should go for it if you have a good reason. If you don't, please don't do it, but have a good reason. So this is the last slide. This is how I translate this into practical advice for policymakers. So I want to proceed in two steps. The first one is, Ignore the ZLB. So assume that monetary policy can do the job of choosing the right interest rate and maintain output and potential. Okay. In this case, monetary policy takes care of output and potential. We don't have to worry about the effects of fiscal austerity on, poten on output because it is, no, the, the monetary authority does the job of maintaining output and potential. So in this case, what would you want to do? Well, I think in this case, you probably want a slow decrease in the debt ratio over time. And you want to do this for two reasons. Uh, you want to increase sustainability, but you have to be realistic because a decrease in the debt ratio will be, you know, one or two percent a year at the most. Uh, more than that could not be offset by monetary policy. So it can be very slow. And then the usual argument, which is you may want to improve the welfare of future generations. That basically plays this role when R is greater than G. That remains true here. So unless you invest to improve the future, for example, you fight global warming, then you know, there is no reason uh, to uh, increase that. But put the other way, if you're going to take measures to limit global warming, it might be justified uh, to increase that for a while. Now, this is, I think that's not the world in which we're going to be. I think this ELB is going to be relevant. This is something I discussed earlier. And so I don't think it's going to be relevant in the sense of you know, binding all the time strictly. I don't think that we're going to see zero nominal rates forever, but we're going, to, we're going to see low nominal rates and that's going to decrease the margin uh, of the room that uh, the BOJ or the central banks have to offset fiscal austerity. Uh, so let's take today, I think if the ZLB is strictly binding, which I would think is the case in, in many countries at this point, then the monetary authority cannot basically do the job of getting output and potential. 
right? So in this case, it's absolutely obvious that the only authority which can do it is the fiscal authority, and it has to run a deficit which is sufficient to get the economy back to, to full employment. And when you sit down and you think about the trade-off, so on, if you do this, you reduce the output gap, you get output closer to potential, which is good. You have a slightly higher future cost and a slightly lower probability of sustainability. But when you sit down with reasonable numbers, I think there is no question that you should go for it and, uh, and just run the deficits which are needed. Here I'm saying something that, you know, the uh, Japanese authorities uh, decided to do uh, long before I, I said anything like that. So I'm just following that. I am totally agreeing with what was done in Japan. Uh, if the ZLB is not binding today, so for example, the rates are two or three percent, but there's still limited room for monetary policy, then, you know, the government has to be ready to do fiscal expansion if needed if there's an adverse shock. And there, it's clear that we have to develop much better automatic stabilizers. I think that's the implication. Fiscal policy has to come in much more than it used to when automatic stabilizers are much more important than they used to be. So implications in terms of the right policies, I mean, COVID-related spending is an example of, you need to give protection to firms, to people, you need to increase demand. I think whatever it takes, even if it increases uh, deficits and increases debt, is what needs to be done. What about public investment? I think there is two steps to the answer. The first one is you should do all the public investment which has a social rate of return greater than R. Uh, no questions asked. How many are left uh, of such investments are left in Japan? Well, it's clear that kind of roads and bridges You've come to the end of it, but there are many other dimensions, uh, some of them triggered by COVID, where can, clearly uh, something can be spent. And then whether you finance it by debt or taxes depends very much on the state of the economy. If you need to sustain demand, you, you're doing this to increase supply, but if you need to do this to sustain demand because demand is too weak, then you finance it more by debt. If instead private demand is strong enough, you finance it for taxes. But I want to separate the doing, which I think is a very simple uh, rule, and the financing, which depends on the state of the economy. Let me take the last issue, uh, which is what if we're in a world in which ZLB, the zero lower bound, binds, uh, we're really at zero, the required fiscal deficits are large, and so they lead to a steady increase in debt ratios. And again, this will resonate with Japan because uh, this has been where Japan has been and hopefully will not be forever, but suppose, suppose that it, it lasts another five years. Then I think we have to think of other ways to stimulate demand. I don't think we can do it just for fiscal deficits because at some stage the debt levels will be too high. And so conceptually you can do it in two ways. You can try to reduce saving or you can try to increase investment, private investment. And so I do not know how much room there is in Japan for reducing precautionary saving, but I would think, for example, that in the US, giving, you know, having a good health insurance system, which we don't have, uh, would make a lot of difference. I don't know what's available in, in, in Japan at this point. And I think that what has happened with COVID is that we realized that there is a number of public investment projects, many in the form of R&D, uh, with respect to both sanitary issues and global warming issues, where public investment makes a lot of sense. And I think there's some evidence that the spillovers to uh, triggering private investment can be quite strong. So if we do either one or both, it may be that we don't need to run deficits and basically we get to full employment to potential output without having to run these large deficits and increase that. I think there's much more to be done. Uh, but that summarizes my, my thoughts at this point, and I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present them. Katsuo.